Welcome, everybody. So glad to have you here today, whether you're joining us online or joining us in person at one of our three locations. Hey, and I've got to tell you that you picked a great day to be here because at the end of our time, we're going to participate in a tradition that dates back almost 2,000 years to Jesus himself as we celebrate baptism. And I believe that all of us will be encouraged by what we experience today. But for these next few minutes, I want to talk about a single word, a word that is one of the most beautiful words in the English language. And this word is at the core of what we believe as Christians. You can't really understand the message of the gospel until you understand this word, and it's the word grace, which is a word that most people know, but few people really understand. And there's a real simple verse of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 12 that says this, See to it that no one misses the grace of God. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. And really, that's my prayer as a pastor. My prayer, my hope is that no one in this church misses the grace of God because it would be a tragedy if you could come to this church and be part of this community and yet somehow miss the grace of God. I'm okay with you missing a lot of things, but don't miss this. Don't miss the grace of God. So, as we talk about grace, let me start with a definition. Here's the the formal theological definition of grace. It means God's unmerited favor. God's unmerited favor. Grace is not something you can earn or buy or work for. It is a gift. It is God's favor poured out on us even though we don't deserve it. I think the best way to understand the meaning of grace is to compare it with a couple of other words. Justice and mercy. Justice means getting what I deserve. Mercy means not getting what I deserve. But grace means something else. It means getting something I don't deserve. Let me illustrate the difference between those three words. Um, I'm sure most of you know what it means to overdraw a bank account. Uh, Probably not your bank account, but you know somebody else has overdrawn their bank account. Now, to be honest, every so often that happens to me. I'll get busy, and I don't pay close enough attention, and I'm writing bills from my checking account, and my wife is paying bills from that same account, and my kids will buy something online with my debit card, and before I know it, my account is overdrawn. doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while it does. So whenever my account is overdrawn, my bank has a choice to make. They can demonstrate justice. They can show mercy or they can extend grace. Now, let me show you what a letter from the bank might look like with each of these three options. So here's here's justice. Your checking account currently shows a negative balance. In accordance with bank regulations, we are charging your checking account a huge overdraft fee in spite of the fact that you don't even have any money in there. Okay, that would be justice, giving me what I deserve. Mercy might sound like this. Your checking account currently shows a negative balance. Since you are a valued customer, we have decided to waive the typical overdraft fee as long as you bring the balance into positive territory within the next 48 hours. So that would be mercy, not giving me what I deserve. As long as I make it right, I avoid the penalty. But grace is different. Grace might sound like this. Your checking account currently shows a negative balance. Knowing how busy you are and how essential your ministry is to this community, we have decided to waive the typical overdraft fee. In addition, we have transferred $2,000 from the account of our bank president into your account just to make sure you have a healthy balance. Furthermore, we have assigned one of our employees to personally manage your finances so that you can focus on more important things. That's grace, giving me something I certainly don't deserve, but something I really, really need. And so we want to talk about grace today. It's a beautiful thing. And as we talk about it, we're going to look together at a passage of Scripture in Titus chapter 2. This book of the Bible gets its name from the fact that it was a letter written to a young pastor named Titus. It was a letter from Paul the Apostle, who was really a mentor to Titus. And here in chapter 2, Paul writes about the power and the beauty of grace. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the entire Bible. Let me begin by reading verses 11 through 14. It says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. 
It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now, let me go back and walk through this passage one sentence at a time, because there is some really important truth that we need to understand from these few verses. Beginning with the first phrase, it says, the grace of God that brings salvation, brings us salvation. In other words, being saved, being rescued from sin and guilt and death, it's got nothing to do with the righteous things we've done. It has everything to do with what God has done for us. It is by his grace. Now, it's interesting to me that according to the most recent survey data, 82% of Americans believe that there is a heaven. And if you walk up to the average person on the street, and if you were to ask them, what does it take to get to heaven? You know, what does it take to be reconciled with God and spend forever with him? The vast majority of people would respond by saying something like this, well, you have to be a good person. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then God will welcome you into heaven. That's the common understanding, but that's not grace. You, you might remember the name Michael Bloomberg. He's a very successful businessman in New York City. He actually ran for president this past year uh, for the Democrat Party. And he was interviewed by the New York Times several years ago. Now, let me read a couple of paragraphs from the article that was written about him. It says, when he sat down for the interview, it was a few days before his 50th college reunion. His mortality was starting to dawn on him at 72. But if he senses that he may not have as much time left as he would like, he has little doubt about what would await him at a judgment day. Pointing to his work on gun safety, obesity, and smoking cessation, he said with a grin, I am telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I am heading straight in. I have earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. He does not struggle with self-confidence. You know, that's actually the opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible teaches that our salvation is not the result of our own effort. It's not the result of our good deeds. It, it is the gift of God's grace. And this, my friends, is what separates the message of the gospel from every religious system out there. Because every religious system out there is some kind of formula for trying to earn God's favor. Whether it's the Buddhist Eightfold Path or the Hindu Cycle of Reincarnation or the Five Pillars of Islam or whatever you may have heard growing up in a church. But the real message of Scripture, the message of the gospel, is that it's the grace of God that brings us salvation. Around here, we summarize the message of Christianity, the message of the gospel in just four words. Jesus in my place. In other words, on the cross, he took our place. He carried our shame. He was condemned so that I could be forgiven. He died so that I could have life. I got a glimpse of this idea in a movie I saw years ago with my kids called The Hunger Games. And the plot of the movie unfolds in this dystopian, very broken future world. And the plot revolves around a, a terrible contest that's held every year called The Hunger Games. And the contestants in The Hunger Games are children. And the winner of The Hunger Games is the one child who survives. It's very dark. And when the authorities come to choose the contestants from District 12, they pull out a slip of paper bearing the name Primrose Everdeen, little girl. As the authorities are about to take Primrose away, her older sister Katniss Everdeen suddenly jumps up and begins shouting, I volunteer, I volunteer, I volunteer to be tribute. So she actually takes her sister's place and says goodbye to her little sister before she herself is taken away to face death in the Hunger Games. And I remember sitting there in that theater in the middle of that very dark movie thinking, I've just seen a glimpse of the gospel. That was me. 
I was condemned, but Jesus stepped in and he took my place. He carried my sin. He accepted my shame. He faced death for me. It's the grace of God that brings salvation. Now, maybe at this point you're thinking, but Mark, isn't it dangerous to talk too much about God's grace and forgiveness? Doesn't that take away you know, people's motivation to be better? And, and, and I would say, no, it's, it's not dangerous and it does not take away our motivation. In fact, when grace is correctly understood, it is a much greater motivation than fear ever could be. Let me go back to uh, Titus chapter 2 and pick up where I left off and keep reading here. Uh, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. It is grace that helps us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. How does the grace of God teach us to say no to all that stuff? One word, gratitude. See, if you really understand grace, if you understand that the Savior stood in your place and took your punishment, then you'll spend the rest of your life living in response to that grace. I mean, the rest of of your life will become one long thank you note. It's like the story of a young woman who who marries a man, and this man turns out to be very demanding and very critical. And every day he would go to work and leave her at home with a long list of jobs to do around the house. And at the end of the day, he would evaluate her work performance, but she never seemed to quite measure up. It was never good enough for him. And he would respond with verbal and physical abuse. I mean, this was her reality for several years. But after five long years of marriage, her husband passed away. But then eventually, as time went by, this same woman fell in love with another man, one who loved her deeply. And they got married. And the second husband was very different. He did everything he could to meet the needs of his new wife, constantly showering her with words of unconditional love and appreciation. And then one day as she was cleaning house, she found tucked away in a drawer one of those lists that her first husband had given her. And as she looked down the list, she realized that she was now doing everything on that list and more for her new husband. And she realized why. She realized that she was so grateful to her husband for loving her so unconditionally that her deepest desire was to please him. Gratitude had compelled her to do things that fear never could. And when we understand God's grace, it will change us. We will live differently, not motivated by fear, but motivated by gratitude. It's like an old hymn that we sang when I was growing up in church. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And God's grace not only redeems us from the sin of our past, and it not only gives us the motivation to live differently in the present, it also gives us hope for the future. A hope that allows us to push through the deepest struggles in our lives. In Titus chapter 2, let's look at the last part of this passage. Uh, Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And listen to this. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, Jesus in my place, to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people who are his very own, eager, driven by gratitude, eager to do what is good as we wait for the blessed hope. You know, whenever we get discouraged as followers of Christ, we can look ahead to the time when history comes to an end and when we will live forever in the presence of our Savior who gave himself to redeem us, as I just read. A few days ago, Debbie and I returned from uh, South Carolina where we spent 10 days with our kids and our grandson. Did I mention I have a grandson now? He's three months old. He is the cutest kid in the entire world. Looks like a little Mitchell and man. He's so chubby. But we had a great time. But the only downside of seeing our kids these days is, is the travel. 11 hours in the car. But there's one thing that makes that trip bearable. It's knowing that at the end of that journey, 
There will be sunshine and warm weather and most importantly, people we love. Listen, our journey in this world may be difficult at times. It may be painful. But at the same time, it can be a joyful journey because of what awaits us at the other end. At the end of this journey, at the end of the cancer, at the end of the loneliness and the suffering, we will live forever in the presence of our Savior in a place where there will be no more crying, no more suffering, no more pain. Because of God's grace, we have that hope and we can cling to that hope. So let me go back to this verse I quoted at the very beginning of this message in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. I don't want anyone to miss the grace of God. So let me explain what it means to receive this grace and have this hope that we've been talking about today. It all comes down to three words beginning with A, B, C. A, B, C. First word is this, admit. Admit your need. We must, first of all, come to terms with our true condition before God. We have to recognize that we can't save ourselves from our sin and shame and death. We need a Savior. Admit. Second word, believe. Believe that Jesus is that Savior. Not just that he existed at some point in history, but he, he was God in the flesh among us. And he took my place and he paid the price I should have paid. Admit, believe, and then commit is the third word, C word. Commit your life to him. Admit, believe, commit. Let me illustrate it this way. When my daughter Olivia was born, she was born with a condition that's fairly common among newborn babies. Her liver wasn't functioning very well, and that created something called jaundice. Her skin was kind of a yellow color, and the whites of her eyes were also a little bit yellow. It's a serious condition. Left untreated, it can be fatal. But fortunately, there was a simple cure. The doctor told us that all she needed was light, because light stimulates the liver and gets it functioning the way it's supposed to. So we took our daughter home, and for several days, we had a wrapper in a special blanket that had light inside it. It would light up. It was a cool-looking thing. It was a very simple solution. Didn't cost us anything. Health insurance paid for it. Within a few days, she was fine. But in order for our daughter to be cured, we had to do three things. Admit, believe, commit. First, we had to admit that there was a problem. We couldn't just say, you know what, we're not going to worry about it. She looks fine to us. If we had ignored her illness, the outcome would have been tragic. So we had to admit there was a problem. Second thing we had to do, we had to believe. Specifically, we had to believe the doctor. We had to believe that he had the credentials and the authority and the experience to fix the problem. And we could have said, <clears throat> put her under a light. I mean, that sounds too easy. How about instead if we just scrub her with soap and water, maybe dip her in some bleach? I mean, certainly if we work hard enough... I'm sure we can get her normal coloring back. We couldn't do that. We had to believe the doctor. We had to admit there was a problem, believe, then third, we had to commit ourselves to the solution. We had to actually go home, put Olivia in that blanket, and trust it to do its work. And because we admitted and believed and committed, she's fine. And now she's in college. The Bible says that all of us are stained by something called sin. And if we don't deal with that problem, the consequence is death, physical and spiritual death. So we have to admit that we have a problem. And then we have to believe that Jesus has the credentials and the authority to provide the remedy for our sin. And then we have to third, commit our lives and eternity to him in faith. And it's possible that for some of you hearing this message right now, that's the first time you've really understood what it means to accept God's grace and become a follower of Christ. And maybe today you can just sense God drawing you and calling you to take this step of admitting and believing and committing. Let me give you a simple way to express that in a prayer. Even right now where you're sitting in one of our locations or watching online, just pray a simple prayer, something like this. Lord, I admit my need for forgiveness and grace. And I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you took the penalty of my sin on the cross. And today I commit my life to you as the forgiver of my sin and the leader of my life. Just admit, believe, 
and then commit. Let me also say a word to those of you who would describe yourselves as followers of Christ. Maybe what we've talked about today isn't new to you at all. But I think it is always a much-needed reminder. It's so important that every so often we come back to the core of our faith, that we come back to the sweet and simple message of grace. Every so often we just need to be reminded of the grace that we have been given and the hope that is ours. And in this life, you will have some health issues, and you'll have money issues, and you'll be lonely at times, and you will be disappointed. But you don't have to let those things control you emotionally. Because when you know that your past is forgiven by grace and that your future is secure by his grace, that just puts everything else in perspective. Well, ever since the beginning of the Christian church, there's been one way that all true followers of Christ have identified themselves with this message of grace that we've been talking about. And that is through the act of baptism. And we're going to end our time together today by celebrating with a number of people across all three of our locations who are taking this step of baptism today. <clears throat> now, some of you might be unfamiliar with baptism. In fact, it may even seem a little strange to you when you see this in a couple of minutes here. So let me explain what we're about to experience here together. Um, in a few minutes, you will see people step into a tank of water then go down underwater, and then come back up. That's called baptism by immersion. And we practice baptism by immersion for a couple of reasons. Number one, Jesus himself was baptized by immersion. When he began his public ministry, he was baptized in the Jordan River, the Bible says. But secondly, baptism by immersion is this powerful, beautiful symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As you watch this, remember, every time we baptize someone, we are retelling the story of the life and mission of Jesus. Baptism is a picture of his death and burial on Good Friday when you go under the water, and his resurrection three days later on Easter morning coming back up out of the water. But baptism not only symbolizes those events in history, it also symbolizes the transformation that's happened in our own lives. It's a way of saying, I have died to my old life. The person that I used to be has been buried. And from this point forward, I will no longer live for myself. I will live for Christ. Baptism by immersion is a powerful moment that you will never forget. And if you're a follower of Christ and haven't taken this step, make sure you jump in next time. Now, you may wonder, why should I do that? Why is baptism so important? Well, here's what baptism is. It, it is the public declaration of an inward commitment. It proclaims death to our old life and our resurrection to a new life in Christ. And that public proclamation is important. Think about marriage. Marriage is based on a relationship of love and commitment between two people. And their love for each other is unseen. It exists within their hearts. But marriage also has a very public side to it. It's called a wedding ceremony. A couple of days ago, I officiated at the wedding ceremony for a young couple in our church, and I stood there as they declared their commitment to each other by reciting vows and exchanging rings in front of family and friends. And that wedding ceremony didn't create the love in their hearts, but it gave them the opportunity to declare that love publicly and have their friends and family right there to celebrate with them and encourage them as they began their new journey together. And that's what baptism does. It takes that personal faith in God and gives us the chance, as people are going to do at all three of our campuses today, the chance to declare it publicly so that others can celebrate with them and encourage them on their journey. Because it's one thing to say in the privacy of your own heart, I'm a follower of Jesus. It's another thing to do what these folks are doing this weekend, to step out of the shadows and say, I am now on record. I want everyone to know that God's grace has changed me. And baptism is the first step of faith, and it's what gives you the momentum to take every other step of faith after that. I think that one of the saddest passages of Scripture in all the Bible is a couple of verses in John chapter 12. Check this out. Speaking of Jesus, many people did believe in him. However, many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. But, and listen to this, they wouldn't admit it 
for fear that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, would expel them from the synagogue. And this is sad. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. In other words, it's describing these people who had faith. But they were afraid to go public with their faith because they were more concerned about the applause of people than the smile of God. Well, this weekend we have, I think, 15 people who want to do just the opposite. They want to openly declare their faith. And as they take this step, you'll get to hear their own story of grace in their own words. And if you're attending in person at one of our locations, you just be sure to clap and cheer and celebrate with everyone who is taking this step today at your location. Let's celebrate together.